Amen. Amen. The mighty prophet of God, Isaiah, thunders forth a wonderful promise and presents a powerful prospect in these verses. God is offering to His people to be their strength and to be their might. Not only in His saving grace and sacrificial act upon Calvary's cross as Savior, but also as the ongoing enabling power of their lives. When a person gets saved by trusting Christ as their Savior, it's just the beginning. It's the beginning of a new life. It's the beginning of a new power. It's the beginning of a new future. Amen. God just doesn't save us and then send us off in our little boat adrift on life's sea. He wants to be there with us and is there with us and He wants to empower us and enable us Amen. and strengthen us. Throughout the Scripture, God has given to us great and exceeding promises of His presence and of His power. Acts chapter 180 says, And ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Amen. First John 4, 5, Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen. Matthew 28, 20, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. In 2 Corinthians 9, 8, the Bible says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. God says, I want to strengthen you. God says, I want to empower you. God says, I want to enable you. For what? He says in our text verse that when we wait on the Lord, He renews our strength so that we can mount up with wings of eagles, so that we can run and not be weary, so that we can walk and not faint. God enables us and empowers us to do, to be doers, doesn't He? Be ye doers of the Word and not hearers only. Throughout the Scripture, God has also given us this encouragement. 2 Thessalonians 3.13 says, Brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And to the Galatians, He says this in chapter 6, verse 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. We can because He will. Amen. Yet many times we feel like giving up, don't we? Sometimes we ask the question, what's the use? We might ask this question, what good is it doing? We might ask this question, why bother to go on? There are those, we ourselves included, who fail from time to time. We get discouraged, we get weary, and we get ready to faint. And such people we find in the Bible. Actually, we find some people in the Bible whose prayer was this. Dear God, kill me now. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. We find the first individual that we want to look at today who, who said, Dear God... Kill me now. We go all the way back to 1 Kings chapter 19. I want to read for you beginning at verse 1. His name is Elijah. Remember Elijah? And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die. And said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Elijah is perhaps one of the most well-known quitters in the Bible. His lapse here has been called the Elijah Syndrome. It is the propensity to say, oh, woe is me. You ever said that? Have you ever just sat down somewhere, maybe not under a juniper tree, but somewhere, and you just felt sorry for yourself, and you just said, oh, woe is me. Maybe you've said, why me? I can imagine Elijah asking this question, why me? In verse 10, Elijah says this. He said, I'm the only one. Look at verse 10. 
1 Kings chapter 19, look at verse 10. And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts of the children of Israel, forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with a sword. And I, even I only am left, and, seek, and they seek my life to take it away. He felt like he's the only one. You ever feel like you're the only one? Nobody cares but me. I'm the only one. Why bother? Elijah's pretty depressed, isn't he? You know what he said? He said, it is enough. He said, I've taken what I can take. I can't take no more. He said, I've got to have it up to here. He said, listen, take away my life, he said. Yeah. It's enough. I can't take anymore. You ever feel like that? I'm sure you have. Yeah. Elijah said it's enough, but look what God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, if you can get there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Elijah said, Lord, it's enough. Lord, take my, my life. What good's it do? I don't want to live anymore. It's enough. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, the Bible says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So Elijah is saying it's enough, and God says, no, it isn't. God said, I'm with you. I haven't given you more than you can bear, Elijah. Now I ask you, who's better to determine what's enough, Elijah or God? But what happened? Elijah got weary, didn't he? He just got weary, and he's fainting. He feels it's all over. He feels it's no use going on. He might as well end all right here and now. But wait a minute. What, what is God going to answer that? What if God would have answered him and said, okay. What if God would have said, okay, Elijah, you want me to kill you now? I'll kill you now. Well, you know what? Then he would never have been able to appoint his successor, Elisha, in chapter 19, verse 19. In 2 Kings chapter 1, he does miracles. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11, is the, the, the famous chariot of fire. In 2 Kings, we find Elisha, whom he had appointed his successor. He, he gives a vessel of oil to a mother and a son who are ready to die. He raises the Shunammite son from the dead. He saves the son of the prophets in chapter 4. And then there's Naaman the leper that God healed. And on and on and on. None of that would have happened if God would have answered Elijah's request to just kill me now. God said, Elijah, I've got a bigger picture. I see far, 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 far more than you see. But Elijah got weary and Elijah fainted. And Elijah said, I don't want to live anymore. God said, you've got to live some more. I've got a lot for you to do. And I've got a successor for you to appoint. You can't go now. Isn't it good that Elijah didn't get his prayer answered? Amen. Some people ask God to kill them or even they contemplate taking their own lives. But wait a minute. I'm glad that God didn't answer Elijah's prayer according to his request. I'm sure that Elisha was glad. I'm sure the mother of the boy with the vessel of oil, they didn't die. I bet she's glad. I bet the Shunammite and her son are glad. I bet the prophets uh, 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 and the sons of the prophets are glad. I, uh, I bet you Naaman's glad Amen. that God didn't answer Elijah's prayer. Let's turn now to Jonah chapter 4. The book of Jonah. Look there with me. Jonah chapter 4, look at verse 1. Now, God had just told Jonah he wanted him to go to Nineveh and preach. Remember that? But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and a merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. It is better for me to die than to live. 
Here is selfish Jonah. Jonah wants to die. Jonah saying, dear God, kill me now. Jonah saying, God, I want to die. And why does he want God to kill him? Because of the goodness of God to the Ninevites. You see, Jonah hated those Ninevites. The Ninevites were a cruel and idolatrous people. And he would have rather seen God kill them than save them. You better be careful about hatred and bitterness in your heart. God loved those Ninevites as much as he loved Jonah. And I want you to know something. God loves the people you hate as much as he loves you. Jonah had done God's command. He said, go preach to those Ninevites. He said, I don't want to. And he tried to run away. And you know the story. God got him back there anyway, didn't he? And so he went ahead and he preached and he preached. And instead of the Ninevites experiencing the revenge, they experienced revival. Instead of being smitten, they were saved. And Elijah now is pouting and throwing a little pity party for himself. Because things didn't go his way. Jonah didn't appreciate the outcome and now he wants God to kill him. Sounds pretty childish, doesn't it? Sounds pretty silly. But nevertheless, there it is. You know, when you, want, when you ask God to kill you, that's, that's pretty foolish and silly. No matter what the circumstances. You see... We don't have the details, but I I take it upon myself to conjecture here. But I have a sneaking suspicion that over the years to follow, Jonah was glad God didn't answer his prayer. And who knows what this prophet of God did after this. How God used him, I don't know. But he wanted to die. Turn with me to Job chapter 7. Here's another man in the scripture. Job chapter 7. Look with me in verse 12. Now Job, we have, we have Elijah and Job, Jonah. Now these two fellows, they actually wanted, to, they wanted God to kill them. They said, God, take my life, kill me now. We come to Job. Now he didn't ask God to kill him, but you know what Job's problem was? He wished he had never been born. Job chapter 12. I'm sorry, chapter 7, verse 12. He said, Am I a sea or a whale that thou settest to watch over me? When I say my bed shall comfort me, my couch shall ease my complaint, then thou scarest me with dreams and terrifiest me through visions, so that my soul chooseth strangling and death rather than my life. I loathe it. I would not live always. Let me alone for my days are vanity. Job sitting here saying, I wish I'd never been born. I'd rather strangle then continue. I'd rather die than keep going on. Job is probably the quintessential example of human suffering. And here he's pretty depressed. And who can blame him? His desire is to die, but God does not take his life. This is a great time of trial and tribulation in the life of a man whom God recorded as a righteous man. Sometimes it's hard for righteous people to suffer. And his friends that came to help him ended up hurting him. God said he was righteous. His friends said, it's all your your fault, Job. And we know different, don't we? But he was suffering. Sometimes we learn our greatest lessons in times of difficulties. If Job would have died in this condition, he and we would have missed the life's lessons and demonstration of the faithfulness of God. Do you know that in Job chapter 42 verses 1 through 6 we have Job's repentance. In Job chapter 42 verses 7 through 9 we have Job's restoration. And in Job chapter 42 verses 10 through 17 we have Job's reward. All of that would have not happened if Job would never have been born. We wouldn't have the Bible account. Do you know how many people over the years have turned to the book of Job and found a will to go on and found comfort and found strength in their God because Job found strength in their God? 
That wouldn't be in the Bible if Job hadn't been born. And the whole rest of it wouldn't have happened if Job would have died when he wanted to be strangled. What if God would have said, okay, Job, and into Job's life? I think his seven sons and three daughters that were born afterwards were glad that God did not answer Job's prayer. I suspect Job was as well. You see, when you're sitting on the ash heap and your skin is falling off and filled with worms and you're scratching yourself and scraping yourself with pieces of pot shirt that you can find in a rubbish heap, all looks lost and hopeless. But now when he's at the end of that trial sitting in his home with seven new sons and three new daughters, it's a whole different story, isn't it? Now he's saying, praise God, praise God. I'm glad God didn't listen to him when he said he'd rather be strangled than to live. Only God sees the end from the beginning and understands all the whys and wherefores of life. I can't answer your whys and wherefores, but God knows. And God has a plan, and God has a reason. And God is good, and God is faithful. That's why we need to trust Him and lean on Him. What did Isaiah say? They that wait upon the Lord. Problem is, sometimes we don't want to wait on the Lord. We just want God to kill us now. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah chapter 20, we see the next man. In chapter 20, verse 14. Jeremiah, he's in the same boat as Job. They would have made good fellowship together. Misery-loving company. Jeremiah has the same complaint that Job had. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 14 says, Cursed be the day wherein I was born. Let not the day wherein my mother bear me be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought tidings to my father, saying, A man child is born unto thee, making him very glad. And let that man be as the cities which the Lord overthrew and repented not. And let him hear the cry in the morning and thy shout and the shouting at noontide. Because he slew me not from the womb, that my mother might have been my grave, that her womb be to be always great with me. Wherefore I came forth out of the womb to see labor and sorrow, that my days should be consumed with shame. Now Jeremiah is a mighty prophet, and he was terribly persecuted and imprisoned for his preaching. He suffered great humiliation and great shames for the cause that God had sent him forth. And he's found here reacting to his situation with the desire of death. He wishes he'd never been born. But had he not been born or had God taken his life here, the history of Israel and the history of the world would be different. The course of world events would have changed. After chapter 20, Jeremiah will preach 31 more times the prophecies of God. Prophecies concerning the Messiah, the tribulation period, the millennial kingdom, Israel's captivity, and false prophets. After chapter 20, he's going to give advice to kings. After chapter 20, he's going to minister to the Jews in Palestine after the fall of Jerusalem. And then he's going to minister to the Jews in Egypt. All of this and more would not have happened if God had hearkened to Jeremiah's complaint and petition for death. There's a whole lot of people, hundreds and thousands of people who were thankful that Jeremiah was born. There were hundreds and thousands of people who were thankful that Jeremiah didn't die in chapter 20. We cannot judge God or our future by our present circumstances. Whatever they may be, however difficult, however dark, however lonely, my dear friend, God is greater than anything you can imagine or think. You don't know what tomorrow holds. And if we extrapolate what we are feeling, what we're going through at the present time, if we extrapolate that to every day in our future, no wonder we want to die. God says, I've got things going to happen you don't even have any clue about. That's why Isaiah said, wait on the Lord. Verse 
Perhaps you do not contemplate the ending of your life by God or by yourself, but you feel like giving up. You feel like quitting. You feel like giving in. You feel like getting out. Don't do it. What makes us get weary and faint? What causes us to quit? Financial pressures? Family problems? Personal problems? Hardships? Illnesses? Offenses? Persecution? Loneliness? Sometimes it's just feelings of being unloved or unappreciated. Yep. The Bible says, wait. Wait. Wait on the Lord. Amen. He alone knows what wonders and what miracles and what people or what ministry awaits you in the months and years to come. Listen, your greatest purpose in life might be next week or next month. Or that thing that God has for you to do here on this planet might be next year. Don't give up now. Don't quit now. Don't give in now. Don't get out now. There's been many a time I've wanted to quit. I've wanted to give up. But I'm glad that the Lord upheld me and kept me going. Amen. Some of you are saved today because God kept me going. Some of you have families today because God kept me going. You know, you never know what God has waiting around the corner for you. If you quit now, you're never going to get around the corner and see what He has for you. Hey, there's just another corner and another corner and another corner. And when you get around this one, look for the next one. And when you get around that one, look for the next one. Don't get weary. Don't quit. Every day is a new day in your life. And your life is the greatest adventure of all. You know, people like to, they like to read these adventure stories, right? Hey, you are an adventure. Your whole life is an adventure. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. All those adventure stories, we read them and we get all thrilled and excited because they're filled with pitfalls and dangers and enemies and troubles. Huh. So is your life, isn't it? Amen. You got all the stuff that's in the book. Yeah, but they always come out victorious. Hey, you can do all things through Christ which strengthens Amen. you. Amen. And we are, we are the victors. We're yeah. more than conquerors through him that loved us. Amen. Life is worth living, yes. and God is worth serving. Yes. yes, we do get weary, and yes, we want to faint. Isaiah said this, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Yes. David said this, wait on the Lord and be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Amen. Solomon said this, but wait on the Lord, and he shall save thee. You know this word wait is the Hebrew word kaval. It means to bind together. I thought that was pretty interesting. It means to bind together, and it says probably by twisting. And you know what, my dear friend, we need to see our lives twisted together with Jesus in that strong bond. That'll strengthen us and keep us. The word also means to look patiently to, to hope patiently for, to trust, implying firmness and constancy of mind. To trust in and wait upon the Lord, the Almighty, the Omnipotent, the Creator, who is all-knowing and everywhere present and faithful and true. Amen. That's the God that Elijah prayed to. And God didn't answer his prayer the way he wanted him to. But Elijah was glad. And Jonah, and God didn't answer his prayer, but Jonah was glad. And Jeremiah, and Job, and God didn't answer their prayers, but they were glad. Sometimes, we just need to trust God and be glad.
Let's bow for a word of prayer. We need to be glad that God is there. And we need to be glad that God knows best. And we ought to be glad that God can. Maybe today you're here as a Christian. You're born again. You're saved. And you feel like quitting something. You may be giving up on someone. Maybe you're discouraged or depressed or discontent. So were many of God's greatest servants. But by the grace of God, they went on. And so can you. You do not know what awaits. You don't know when the rainbow after the flood or the sunshine after the rain will appear. But God does. And he's faithful and he's true. Determined to go on by the grace of God and discover what God has for you up ahead. Along the way, on the greatest adventure of all, your life in Christ. You say, preacher, I've, I have been discouraged. I've been depressed. But I think I'll just go on. Would you raise your hand and say, that's me. All right, thank you. You say, preacher, I, I felt like quitting. I felt like giving up, but I think I'll just go on. Put your hand up. Let me see it. Yes. Sometimes you say, preacher, I don't understand why it's going on. I don't understand what it's for, but I'm going to wait on the Lord. I'm just going to trust God. You put up your hand and say, that's me. I'm going to wait it out. Because my God has a purpose and a plan. All right. Thank you. Maybe you're here today and you're not a born-again Christian. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It is true. Christians do get discouraged. and Sometimes Christians fail and sometimes we give up. But the truth is, That those who have been born again into God's family by his grace and through their faith are not alone. They have a savior. God their father has promised to provide a strength and a power that is impossible with men but possible with God. The Lord Jesus does not want you to die without him and spend eternity in the lake of fire because of your sin. And so being God, he came to earth became a man by being born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He offered himself as your substitute on the cross of Calvary. He died there and shed his blood to pay for your sins. He was buried and rose again with the power and authority to forgive sins and give eternal life. And this he has done for you because he loves you. And now he desires for you to call upon him and trust him as your savior. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Maybe this morning you say, you know what, preacher, I've never been born again. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven but I'd like to be, and I'm here today, and I'd like to take Christ as my Savior once and for all. I can help you. We can pray together, and you can ask the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior right where you sit. You say, preacher, I'd like to do that. I don't want to wait any longer. If that's what you want to do, then you look up at me, and you keep looking at me until I see you, and I see you, and you see me. I'll know that you want to trust Christ as your Savior right where you are, right where you sit. All right, you're looking up, I'm looking, don't look back down until I see you. And when I see you, I'll know that you want to pray and trust Christ as your Savior. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your love and for your kindness. We thank you for your grace, we thank you for your attributes. We thank you, Father, that we can wait on you and you'll do right. Thank you, Father, that... When we wait on you, you'll strengthen us so that we can fly above our troubles and circumstances. We can run. We can walk. We won't faint because we have the strength of the indwelling Holy Spirit. We have the power of God at work in our lives. But Father, if we don't wait on you and we just trust into our own resources, we'll faint. Help us today to come to the altar of God and say, Oh, Lord, I, I wanted to quit. I wanted to give up but I'm not. Help me. 
Perhaps we've been discouraged and depressed. May we come and say, Lord, encourage me and strengthen me like you promised in your word. And Father, there are some who just need to wait, wait, wait. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And Father, if there's anyone in this room that needs to be saved, they're not sure they're going to heaven, may you give them the courage to come and meet me at the front. We'll help them with that. We'll give you the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together, please. We're going to sing our closing hymn. And that is number 482. More about Jesus. 482. If the Lord has shown you something, He's helped you with something, He's encouraged you about something, why don't you come? Maybe you need to come and say, Boy, I was ready to give up. I was ready to quit. I was, ready to, I was getting faint. Well, that's the time to wait on the Lord. If you need to be saved, you have questions about salvation. You have questions about God or the Bible. You want to talk to somebody about it. You come and see me, all right? We'll help you. We want to spend some time with you and share with you what God has in His Word. But you come and see me. We'll help you. We're going to sing that first stanza. You come as the Lord leads, all right? More about Jesus' Word. If you remember, Rachel got saved last week, and now she's come forward. She wants to be baptized next week. Amen. So I want you to be praying for Rachel. We're excited that she's saved and wants to follow the Lord in scriptural baptism. Amen. We're going to sing that next stanza. Maybe you need to get baptized. I know you, you've been saved, but you never got baptized after you got saved. That's when you get baptized, according to the Bible. And it's a picture of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why don't you come? We're going to sing that next stanza. If you need to be saved, you come and see me. If you need to be baptized, you come and see me. All right? On that next stanza. More about Jesus in His Word. Holy communion with my Lord. Hearing His voice in every life. And the decisions you make affect more people than you'll ever realize. That's why we need to wait on the Lord. That's why we need to be strengthened and encouraged by Him so that we can go forward and be used of God. I'm going to ask Brother Rob if he'd come up and close us in prayer, and then we'll be dismissed.
Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for we, what we have in Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us not to have an attitude of entitlement, but help us to realize what we have is by grace. And Father, that you have a plan for us. And Lord, when we don't understand, just help us to trust you. And Father, we just pray that you would encourage each one as we leave out of this place, that you would strengthen us. Help us to have the right perspective in life. Help us to see with the eye of faith and help us to accomplish the, the mission that you have for us, Lord. We thank you for our pastor. We thank you for giving him this message for us this morning. And Lord, we just pray that you'd bless and protect each one and bring us all back safely for the next appointed service. We ask it in Jesus' name.